Hello, Chris. Chris. Hi, Bill. How's it going? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm coming to you live from an entirely different venue than normal. I'm usually sitting at my desk uh, at my office and have these, like, birds on the wall behind me, <laughs> uh, courtesy my, my, my coworker slash fiance. Anyways, uh, but now I'm here at the PJTV uh, studios in Washington. Um, I've started uh, co-hosting a new show with them, and we just finished up taping our episodes for this week. What's and the name of the show? Uh, still to be determined. Um, so it's right now kind of working title is Washington Roundtable. Um, but it's me and then Katie Pavlich from Town Hall and Amy Holmes from America's Morning News, and we are all sort of chattering about uh, the, the politics of the day and conservatism. I think we managed to get in some royal wedding chit chat this time. So, <laughs> so, so, so it's sort of, so sort, of sort of Fox and Friends with with less idiocy. <laughs> I don't even know how to respond to that. Does, are you, so I'm, I, would I be the Steve Ducey? Or would I be... No, I, I'm, I'm not trying to insult you. <laughs> oh, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, but it's but it will be on PJTV.com? Uh, yes, so it's Pajamas Media's uh, TV. So yeah, PJTV.com. Um, I'll be the one in the right pink shirt. All right. And is it daily, <laughs> weekly? Uh, so it's kind of, uh, we, we, we film once a week, and it will go up. Um, it goes up on Fridays, and then I think there will be other clips going up Saturday and Sunday because we we sort of shot three different segments today talking about um, different issues. So very exciting. Uh, but you're, you have, you've been able not to nearly it. as exciting as what's going on in Congress. <laughs> <laughs> you know, many will dispute that. Uh, but uh, before we talked, uh, the the House just passed the 2011 budget deal, which prevents the government shutdown, funds the government through September 30th, still has to pass the Senate, and I guess there is a mild uh, notion that someone could fill a bus trip, but I think uh, Rand Paul threatened that briefly and then backed down, so mm -hmm. in all likelihood that passes the Senate and gets signed by the President shortly. Um, there was certainly a lot of uh, uh, dissatisfaction on the left with the President's handling of these negotiations. But I imagine the the attitude on the right is a little less easy to simplify. Uh, that is correct. So it's it's difficult to it's it's very hard to simplify because you sort of have three camps. You have those who think the deal is good, is as good as we're going to get. Let's pass it and move on. Then in another camp, you have those who think this deal is terrible. This is it's horrible that we promised 100 billion and now we're barely eking out little tiny pieces. This is ridiculous. And then you have the camp into which I would say I fall, the editors of Na National Review fall, uh, where we got our heart broken uh, by the CBO numbers that came out yesterday. Uh, I, I have now actually begun to... So, so, so Republicans are now <laughs> listening to the CBO again. Well, they are <laughs> gravely concerned that the CBO numbers ha are confirming their worst fears, I suppose is the way I would put it, that uh, there are that many of the cuts were the smoke and mirrors was the word that John Boehner used uh, very frequently and um, is what I think folks are thinking, well, look, it really was smoke and mirrors. So the, the sort of you know loud opposition came from folks, uh, for instance, Eric Erickson at redstate.com um, in a post entitled Bipartisan Mendacity, uh, who basically takes both parties to task for saying, quote, what started out as 38.5 billion in cuts turned around turned into around 14 billion in cuts and a bunch of accounting gimmicks. Each new day brings new disgusting revelations. According to the Congressional Budget Office, total federal outlays will still rise by approximately 177 billion. Yes, that says rise, not decrease. More startling, the Congressional Budget Office reports that the deficit will only be cut by 352 million. That's million with an M. The budget deficit will still be 1.6 billion this year. Um, so on the other side, you have folks like Bill Crystal, who blogged uh, yesterday at Weekly Standard, say yes to the CR mess, uh, and by, he says, don't be distracted from the main fight. Uh, his, his, he says, quote, even if the savings from the CR are a pittance and the deal shot through with gimmicks and one-time savings, even if it's a dog's breakfast of a budgetary ledger domain that was oversold, dependent on classic Washington budget trickery that embodies business as usual, uh, he's there. He's quoting the National Review um, post entitled "Strike One," which I'll get to in a second. Uh, so he says, even if even if that's true, if National Review's wrong, I think to conclude, quote, we'd vote no, even if we understand the impulse to move on to more important matters uh, to avoid a leap into the dark that might include a potentially damaging shutdown. Crystal says, I'd vote yes. The CR may be a mess. It's certainly a sideshow. Perhaps John Boehner could have gotten a better deal, but it wouldn't have made much difference in the big picture budget fight anyway. 
That fight is now underway, and the 2012 CR will be little noted nor long remembered, um, unless the CR fractures Republicans. Well, that's sort of a theme I see on both the left and the right. There's always a – and I'll, I'll get more into what some of the posts on the left was in a second – but there seems to be a presumption always that however the present deal goes will always determine how every subsequent deal will go. And it's always a slippery slope. It's always the leverage that you have today will most certainly be the leverage that you Even have now, tomorrow. And they've got you over a barrel tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Um, I, I think uh, – I mean, I, I came out of this, and I actually wrote a piece for The Daily um, on Sunday that was that gave extreme praise to Boehner, because I thought, you know, he's really had to accomplish the almost impossible, which in, in the almost impossible being set up by a series of things that may have been marketing blunders on the part of Republicans um, and just sort of the way our government is set up. You know, he loves to say, I'm half of one third of the government. Um, which the Supreme Court should be making policy. We'll set that aside. <laughs> so, uh, you know, maybe one half of uh, one half of the policy making portions of the government, uh, if you're if you're into that. Um, it, so he had to make Obama happy. He had to make Harry Reid happy. He had to make as many of the Tea Party caucus members happy as he possibly could. Which that in and of itself is really tough. And had to do all of this within the constraint of it's April and. The end of the fiscal year is September. So I have I have now, I, I sort of, my personal path on this has followed the path of the National Review Editorial Board, where they, over the weekend, were extremely like, effusive about the deal. Um, and, uh, you know, and I thought that Boehner had done a good job as well, in that most of his statements were not over the top. He wasn't out there with, with really fiery rhetoric, that he mostly just sort of played it cool. He was like, no drama Boehner, um, would come out, give these short, snappy statements and run back into the room. <laughs> he probably wanted a cigarette. And, you know, and so I, you know, I gave him a lot of credit for that for he sort of played it cool and, you know, tried to thread the impossible needle and somehow made it work and look, the government didn't shut down. Um, so National Review, I think I'd mentioned this before, they have Strike One is the name of the post that they posted up today. We initially supported the deal House Speaker John Boehner cut with the White House to cut $38.5 billion from the rest of the fiscal 2011 budget. It was only a pittance in the context of all of Washington's red ink, but seemed an acceptable start, even if we assumed it would be imperfect in its details. What we didn't assume was that the agreement would be shot through with gimmicks and one-time savings. What had looked like broad outlines, what had looked in broad outlines like a modest success now looks like a sodden disappointment. Um, which has now led to a number of conservative bloggers really trying to parse through just how bad this was. Um, you have Philip Klein at The Examiner, uh, formerly of American Spectator, who's been tweeting a lot today about what the different CBO numbers mean or don't mean or how much, the, how, whether the cuts are real or are not real. Um, but I think the, the sort of most critical post on all of this was at the Weekly Standard um, by John McCormick who goes through and figures that, so this, this 352 million number that came out of the CBO is pretty miserable, uh, but is also not really an, a completely accurate reflection of, um, of what the, the agreement has, because you're talking, A, that, that time horizon, it's very short, and many of these cuts um, would have eliminated, you know, eliminated or zeroed out programs, and that's going to be savings that will feel further, 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 further down the road. So. Um, there's that sort of thing. There's the difference between, you know, what is a rescission of money? Uh, you know, what do you do? What is a cut for money that was never really spent? And, you know, how do we, how do we handle uh, allowances for money that might not have ever been spent, that we think it wasn't going to be spent um, by, for instance, a czar that no longer exists, things along those lines. So uh, I think conservatives are completely within their rights to be hugely disappointed by these CBO numbers that have come out, because I think it sort of is confirming a lot of worst fears. Um, but I also still give Republican leadership some credit, because trying to get this, you know, deal to have real serious cuts this year that would be felt in a serious way and would have a significant impact on deficits and stuff, is just in incredibly difficult, given how far into the fiscal year we already are. I think their biggest mistake was promising $100 billion to start with. Now, there seems to be a, a disconnect between uh, Washington Republicans, which, I mean, and I'll say I, I made several predictions that there would be a shutdown because I didn't believe Boehner could hold together his caucus, and, they were, and the caucus was too aligned with, with the Tea Party right that were, were chanting, cut it or shut it, and that proved wrong that Boehner did have 
uh, was able to corral his caucus. Uh, he had 59 defections. I think that's a, roughly a, a quarter of his caucus that he lost, uh, but that's really not enough to threaten his hold on, on power. And it would seem that the caucus's general attitude was uh, get what you can and not start playing with fire in, in regards to shutting down the government and all the other kinds of uh, ramifications and consequences that, that go with that. Uh, whereas when you look at the, the polling, uh, at least the CNN poll that, that came out, you saw much more support for the, you saw general support for the deal overall. You saw more support for the deal amongst Democrats and independents and less support among Republicans. Uh, so there seems to be a disconnect between the Republican voter base, which seems to be in cut it or shut it mode, we're going to be greased tomorrow if you don't do something radical, and if you don't do it radical, what's the point? Uh, whereas those in power are saying, let's, you know, let's do this in, 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 in whatever steps we can and, um, and, and build from there. Whereas on, if I can segue to what's going on in the liberal blogosphere, uh, you know, al almost uniform derision at how Obama handled this, uh, that he got rolled, that uh, this was, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I think there was people who were looking for uh, a shutdown as a way to exemplify how unreasonable the Republicans were and that Obama got, um, uh, and that Obama, uh, you know, t turned away a strong hand. Uh, so you have uh, Mike Potts at the American Prospect saying, as Greg Sargent points out, these battles are happening more and more on conservative turf. That's what happens when you cede so much ground from the start. Progressives, progressives want a robust budget from Obama that did not cut spending on important domestic programs, and they got the opposite. Uh, I went to a background meeting a few months ago during with a Treasury official, said that the idea behind the budget was to decrease pressure to cut spending on necessary stimulative programs right now. That didn't happen. Obama has always tried to walk a line down the middle, and I've rarely seen it work. Uh, Digby at Hullabaloo, uh, even more uh, incredulous, uh, uh, basically talking about how um, uh, everyone in Washington is, is, is celebrating these sort of cuts. Um, uh, quote, I, I'm going to move into my car, empty out my bank account, and give the money to a rich person so he'll win the future for me. Isn't that what all responsible families are doing right now? Um, and I, I'd say that's a, 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 a fairly uniform attitude. Uh, in the liberal blogosphere, um, although that does seem to be in some disconnect with the broader democratic base, which uh, I think Jonathan Chain pointed, pointed this out several weeks ago, that the democratic base is far more interested in compromise than the Republican base. The polling had shown that they were looking, for, they were asking for Democrats to be willing to give on their ideals in, uh, in, to avoid the more serious effect of a government shutdown. And probably the only blogger I've seen out there that really uh, um, carried that notion was Kevin Drum at Mother Jones, who said, the more I think about the budget deal that Bob agreed to last week, the less apocalyptic it seems to me. It's true that macroeconomically speaking, this is the wrong time to be cutting spending, but let's face it, $38 billion in spending just isn't that big a deal at a macro level. It may have a negative effect, but it's a pretty small negative effect. Uh, and you know, one thing that uh, I've pointed out that I haven't seen uh, anyone else mention is when the, uh, the 1995 shutdown happened, which went on, there was a five-day one, then a three-week one, it took a full point off the GDP for that quarter. Uh, now, it bounced back the next quarter, so it was no overall loss to the economy, but that was a more resilient economy. And sort of a legitimate question whether a shutdown now would would spiral us into a double dip recession. So as as anti stimulative as this level of cuts are, as Kevin Drum said, probably would pale in comparison to um, something that could, if, if it was a protracted shutdown, leading to a double dip recession. And whatever political points you were able to score of Republicans for inducing a shutdown, you might lose by 2012 if the economy was severely mired in in, in recession at that point. So it's not an argument to say that the, the deal is good policy-wise, but it, 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 does, it does strengthen the less bad argument if you were so inclined. I feel, I, I wonder to what extent you think this has mirrored the kerfluffle over the extension of the Bush tax cuts, uh, in that I recall when that first came out and it was, it was said like, oh, Obama's going to support an extension of the tax cuts even for the richest 1% of Americans. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I recall conservatives, we were all doing a victory ants in the end zone, and you know, I believe the, the lefty blogosphere was not pleased. And, I, and then I saw that debate transition, and all of a sudden you had, you know, a couple weeks in, folks started reading what was, or a couple days into it, folks were reading what was in it, and Jim DeMint came out and was like, this is not a good deal. <laughs> this, it sort of seems to be taking that same path, where initially I think conservatives were like, at the, you know, at the 11th hour, quite literally, oh, hey, we got an extra billion dollars in cuts, fantastic, yes, oh, we did it, we kept the government open, this is John Bader, a hero. And now that it's happened, we're like, oh, this, ugh, this is not, it's sort of like a, a sobering up uh, the next day and going, what What did I do, what did I do, uh, is, is what I think you're seeing. A lot, I mean, that's, you saw the flip in the NRO reporting, or at the National Review Editorial Board, and I think that that is, they are not alone in their sort of like, what did we just sign on to? Um, well, the, have the, you seen the, that in the in the? Have you seen a shift? The, or to what extent do you think that this parallels what the left thought about the, the original Bush tax cut extension? Well, the the up and down on the right may be parallel. I think on the as far as the left liberal blogosphere is concerned, I think it's a straight line. Okay. <laughs> just, I mean, there's a basic attitude in the more prominent. Uh, well-read corners of the liberal blogosphere that Obama is is not a progressive, uh, that he, um, I mean, to the extent there's a debate in the liberal blogosphere, Glenn Greenwald tried to highlight this, which is between the people who think Obama is a bad negotiator um, who, who sacrifices his liberal ideals uh, versus the Glenn Greenwald view, which is Obama's not liberal in the first place, it isn't, it isn't trying to pursue liberal ends, and therefore getting exactly what he wants. You know, so it's, it's all coming from a fairly pessimistic and cynical perspective on the left. Um, but you know, we do always have to take some caution, I think, in assuming that speaks to uh, a broader view amongst liberals and Democrats generally. That that CNN poll that came out showed that only 18 um, percent of Americans. Uh, thought that Obama gave away too much. Now that um, that 18 percent obviously is all coming out of the Democratic base, uh, but it's, not, it's certainly not the majority of the Democratic base. Um, you know, at, at, at best, you might say, you know, it's a little a little less than half. So you might you might you might take that and say, oh, that might de that might depress uh, enthusiasm. Um, uh, you know, knocking on doors, giving money, all that sort of thing, and uh, that's certainly the kind of thing that uh, Progressive Change Campaign Committee is trying to exploit. You know, uh, uh, when, when when they uh, take on the president directly in their their email actions, um, but the White House seems to be making the bet that you know a certain amount of that agita is going to be expected when you're when you're governing and cutting deals, and to the extent that. Everyone in that camp is going to sit on their hands come 2012. They're thinking it's probably unlikely. Yeah, and I, I wonder to what extent this whole deal has impeded the chances of getting, uh, or to what extent it's raised the risk that the debt ceiling won't be raised or that we will have a serious impasse uh, in future years. If I felt like if conservatives had come away from this feeling like they got a pretty good deal, that they'd be more willing to play ball on future things, uh, whereas if they felt like they kind of got the short end of the stick and that they, they got a raw deal, that they'd be less trusting of Boehner to say, oh, no, no, we promise we got this really great deal for you guys if you just vote to raise the debt ceiling, that, that if that trust erodes, that's going to make it, uh, that's going to create a much more significant risk that things like the debt ceiling or things like, a things like the debt ceiling don't, um, that the debt limit doesn't get raised, or that in the future we may face another shutdown. Now, um, now one, of the, one of the few people in the liberal blogosphere that is um, strongly defending the White House on these deals is Robert Creamer. Uh, and he doesn't have his own blog, but he posts at Huffington Post and, and tends to get some attention uh, at times when he does so. And he made the argument that. Uh, that this actually, the deal loses Republican leverage over the debt ceiling matter because it shows that the bulk of the Republican House caucus is not interested in having shutdowns. I mean, if they wanted to go to the mat on it, they certainly could have. Uh, they thought it was going to be in their political interest to do so. Uh, they sort of would, would have been cheered on by Tea Party folks who were chanting, cut it or shut it. Um, but if you weren't willing to do a shutdown now, which would you know, t technically be a partial government shutdown, it would not grind everything to a halt, uh, 
and you could, you could, it, it, you could sort of let it go on for a few weeks and see what would happen uh, if you were so inclined. Uh, whereas to default on the debt ceiling, to, to default on the debt limit, um, if you let that go, you know, the, 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 technical, the technical end of the debt limit would be reached in mid-May. Treasury can, can pull some levers around for a few weeks until, until early July until they would literally default on, on the debt and jeopardize the full faith and credit of the American government. Most analysts would say that would that would spark a you know global economic meltdown at that point, which would be a really serious problem. I would I would imagine Republicans weren't willing to, to, to throw the dice on this one. I, I can't see them throwing the dice on that one. And that was Kramer's argument that their that their language would be weakened. Now, of course, you're already seeing some concern on the left that the president is making signals that he will be willing to accept concessions to raise the debt limit and some complaints that he's already showing a weak hand there and making premature concessions, yada, yada, yada. But uh, I, I, I don't know what the right is thinking about that right now if they're already trying to press Boehner to uh, draw a firm line and be willing to default on the debt or not. Uh, I don't know to what, the, what consequences uh, House leadership has the stomach for. Um, I know that there are some folks in the Senate on the right I think it's Pat Toomey who has a piece of legislation that has been that's uh, that's been circulating where it would say that instead of not paying the debt, what we would do is we would just take all of our money and instead of paying for all the other things government needs to pay for, you would just pay the debt to prevent default. Now there are I'm, I'm not defending the policy specifics of that, and that's a totally separate conversation. But uh, there's I, I think that there is chit chat that maybe we don't have to raise the debt ceiling and the apocalypse would not occur. Um, which I think is an argument that conservative policy folks, you know, I will will debate and we'll see to what extent uh, folks on the Hill uh, come to understand the consequences. I am persuaded that uh, defaulting on the debt would be a horrible thing, <laughs> and that we ought to do all in our power not to uh, not to do that. Um, but I think I think that the the political benefits that Republicans can derive from setting up this clear contrast about our nation's fiscal health and the debt limit. Uh, I think that they will try to get uh, an awful lot out of that because I think I think President Obama has much more at risk with the debt ceiling than with a shutdown. With a shutdown, it was likely that Republicans would get a significant portion of the blame. If there is global economic meltdown, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying Republicans want to play politics and like melt down the global government to win an election. That's not the case. But I think that Obama is the one that has much more on the line than Republicans do politically when it comes to the debt ceiling. Well, I think it was Nate Silver in his, in his New York Times 538 blog that tried to make the argument that essentially that Boehner, McConnell, and Obama's fortunes are, are linked on these sorts of issues, that they all survive together and they all collapse together. Therefore, the three of them have a political interest in cutting these deals uh, because the, the, the fault will not necessarily fall on one party or the other, but just on people in power for not getting it done. Yeah, I think there's I think there's a real potential of that. I mean, this last election, the debate was, was it an anti-Democrat election or was it an anti-incumbent election? Uh, and I think it was largely an anti-Democrat an anti-democratic election, but I think that overreading into it, and if you know, voters weren't in love with the Republicans who were still here. Either it was a, a, a significant bit of a pox in both your houses, and I think that what's been most interesting to me, and I can't wait to see the breakdown of which members were the Republicans who defected on this one, is is it really a left-right divide, or I mean, is it a centrist, moderate versus conservative Tea Party divide in the Republican Party, or is it going to be a long-term incumbent versus new person uh, dynamic, where these freshman members who do not, you know, the, the folks who have been in for a while have this significant vested interest in staying here uh, and may want to hold on to it a little stronger than the folks who are like, I'm going for one term and I'm going to do what I want and if it means I don't get reelected, then so be it. I mean, I don't know to what extent those statements are real, but you know, you've got a little bit of that from some of these freshman members. Like, I was told to go to Washington uh, to, to save America's fiscal future. And if it doesn't, if I, if, and if I go, if I die trying, then I, then I lose trying, you know. So, uh, since we're talking about the debt limit, we should probably segue into the larger issue of okay. the 2012 budget, uh, the House Republican budget, um, which should be voted on, uh, might even be voted on by the time this airs uh, on Friday, uh, and, and the President's speech laying out his uh, long-range budget vision. Uh, I do want to uh, set this up a little bit, because I, I get the sense that not everybody gets the, the legislative uh, schedule on all this stuff. 
so forgive me if I'm if if I'm doing uh, an unnecessary you know Congress 101 here, uh, but you know we just had this 2011 budget deal because there was a literal expiration of the government's operational authority. They had to pass something or else the government shuts down. Now the government has funding authority till September 30th. So there wouldn't be any risk of shutdown until then. There's this debt limit issue that comes up um, beginning in mid-May. Maybe the, the real drop dead there is, is early July. Um, as far as the 2012 budget is concerned, you don't have to to pass a 2012 budget. Um, there's nothing that is constitutionally required as far as passing a you know budget guidelines, which is what a budget resolution essentially is. It's just how Congress typically sets up their funding. They, they pass a budget resolution. The President doesn't even sign it. It's just what the House and Senate do. And then that gives the congressional committees their guidance for passing their individual appropriations bills. Uh, and in fact, this did not even happen in 2010, which Republicans mocked Democrats about. You couldn't even pass a budget. You know, you're not seriously governing. Um, but they uh, but they passed continuing resolutions, which were essentially sort of running government on, on relative autopilot. Uh, and that's what these last few votes have been about, continuing resolution uh, extensions. So uh, on one hand, uh, the president has a budget proposal, and the House Republicans have a budget proposal and they're fighting that out, but they don't have to meet in the middle uh, at all if they don't want to. Uh, they don't have to find a, a middle ground in that to avoid a debt limit crisis. They, they can avoid a debt limit crisis with any kind of side deal they want to, to agree upon or no side deal at all if someone just wants to blink first and just pass the debt limit. Um, so the question now becomes what goes in, I mean obviously there's a lot of talk about what, what the side deal would be and the, and the White House seems to be indicating they're willing to accept some sort of side deal even though they're saying they should, the, the issue should be, be made separate. Uh, and the two budget proposals just are sort of the opening you know, uh, chips uh, in that discussion. So with that uh, background in mind, uh, you know, Paul Ryan went first on the House side, which some would argue was exactly what the president wanted to see happen. Uh, and uh, he, his gambit was, let's put Medicare and Medicaid right in the crosshairs. Let's dismantle it as, as we know it today. Let's end it being a, a guaranteed benefit for, for seniors, uh, for Medicare for, the, for seniors and Medicaid for the poor, uh, turn into a, a defined uh, you know, a defined benefit program where there's a lump sum that goes to private insurance companies in the case of Medicare, there's a lump sum that goes to states in the case of Medicaid, uh, and you get what you get, and if the costs are too much, either you pay more out of your own pocket or you don't spend as much on health care and you, and, you, and you live with the consequences. Uh, and, you know, that, the House is, if they haven't already, you're going to vote on that very, very shortly. And there's some reporting in Politico that there are Republicans in Congress who are in Baltimore districts saying, why are you making me do this? Why is this really a necessary vote for us to take right here and now uh, when I'm trying to get, get reelected and keep a Republican uh, majority in the president and use that budget very much as his foil uh, in his speech? So I guess my question to you is before getting to liberal reaction to the president's speech, um, what's the conservative reaction to the, str the strategic choice that Ryan is taking? Uh, the reaction, I think, has been relatively positive. Uh, there, well, there's a, a post at From Forum, Noah Christula Green, uh, talking about, it's, the title is, Ryan, my budget is a political winner. Uh, and he does not believe that the budget is, pol is a political winner, but Ryan and sort of the folks who are proponents of his legislation believe that the sort of taking a bold step, showing that you're serious, showing that you have some kind of plan to pull America back from the brink, is a political winner. That this is that the last election was about, uh, in many ways, about getting a, you know responsible governance and getting our fiscal house in order. And so, uh, it's a political winner that Republicans have come out with something uh, strong and bold, and uh, Democrats have have sort of punted on this one that. The Obama budget itself was unacceptable, and that yesterday's speech still didn't really outline much of a serious plan. Um, so, anyways, to go back to this from forum uh, piece, he, he's talking about Paul Ryan's reaction to Obama's speech. Where Paul Ryan was not very pleased, felt that he had been in, invited to get an extended an olive branch, and then uh, was, you know, sort of got insulted to his face by the president. Um, but so, no, Christian Green from forum. Um, Paul Ryan is shocked that the president has attacked. The president has attacked his budget proposal and is now painting the GOP as a party which wants to leave seniors to fend for themselves. Uh, and 
you know, goes through that Fred Barnes asked Ryan about the politics of the budget. Ar Ryan argued that he knew his plan would be attacked, but that he believes the country is on his side. This is a quote from Paul Ryan. I really do believe that this is a political liability. Here's why. People feel there's a fiscal and economic pro program. Most people know we are on the wrong track. The specifics may not, maybe not so much, but that's why we do town hall meetings. I get nervous when we're in the job, in the position of explaining in town hall meetings what our policy does, because is that not exactly where Democrats were about health care reform? So that concerns me, but it's sort of an unavoidable reality when you're talking about um, this sort of thing. I think the the biggest talking point that conservatives or the republic, the, the sentiment I've seen is that this. Democrats are proving through their actions that they're not serious and that the Ryan plan, for all of its potential risks, still does show a level of seriousness. Um, there's a post by Guy Benson from townhall.com, quote, White House Social Security is not in crisis, uh, where he references, um, he references a White House fact sheet released in advance of the President's debt speech. Uh, it says, wraps any discussion of near-term changes in Social Security and its 18 trillion unfunded liabilities in a cold wet blanket. Social Security. The President does not believe Social Security is in crisis, nor is a driver of our near-term deficit problems. Now, to be fair, uh, Paul Ryan's plan does not address Social Security either. Um, but I think conservatives are sort of using the drumbeat that Obama remains unserious about the long-term fiscal health of the country, that his only solution seems to be raising taxes on the rich, which is highly debatable whether that is actually a, an effective solution to, deficit, to reducing um, deficits. And as a result, Republicans are the only serious ones, and voters will reward us. Well, yeah, the Social Security question is an interesting one because if you actually read the the Simpson Bowles report, um, the White House Deficit Commission, which you know liberals you know generally uh, are, are appalled by, um, they actually acknowledge that Social Security is separate from the long-range deficit issue. Uh, there's arguably a Social Security long-term insolvency problem in and of, in and of itself for its own program, but it's not a but it's not a driver of the overall. Uh, deficit issue, and then there's a debate whether, okay, well, how serious is that solvency problem, and how how quickly do you have to address that? Which most liberals would say it's not imminent, and the president uh, generally seems to agree with that rhetorically. Although it certainly keeps the door open to more to to changes uh, than most liberals are, are comfortable with. Uh, and Paul Ryan, you know, it tacitly acknowledges that with his budget by not addressing Social Security with a lot of specifics. And Paul Ryan has said, you know, the main driver of our long-range deficit problems is health care costs, which is something like that folks on the left agree with. Uh, there's just a disagreement on is that because of Medicare and Medicaid or are Medicare and Medicaid the symptoms of a problem with the broader health care system? And to the extent that liberals were very happy with the president's speech on Wednesday was that he, he came down rhetorically on the side of it being a broader health care systematic issue, not one where Medicare and Medicaid are the primary uh, causes of the problem. And then and, and his additional ideas for reforms involved uh, things that would, I mean, that he used Medicare as a reform driver in talking about the Independent Payments Advisory Board, how it would handle reimbursements and what types of things it would reimburse. But the idea of using things that would uh, create changes that would ripple out through the whole healthcare system and not things that would just simply cut Medicare benefits for people. Uh, well, uh, I'm going to push back on you on that one. I think sure. that in many ways, uh, and this is another sort of uh, uh, criticism that I've seen pop up in the blogosphere, is that in many ways the Ryan plan is an odd, ex I don't want to say extension, but it's it sort of goes nicely with the Obamacare, it, with the, I, it goes, the, the Affordable Care Act is, has elements of it that are not so different from what Paul Ryan or the Ryan Ridlin concept is. Well, he, he, he keeps the savings. He keeps the savings of the Affordable Care Act. Well, I, I think that what he, that this isn't trying to say we're going to give people less health care. The idea, theoretically, is that by giving consumers the opportunity to make decisions about their health care and incentivizing them to choose plans that are appropriate for them, you can take steps to reduce the overconsumption of health care. You can take steps to allow waste, fraud, and abuse in the system or you know, unnecessary treatment, things that are not of good value, to be rooted out by consumer decisions across millions of seniors rather than by 15 people on a board. And so it's just a difference in, so I think it was, uh, there's a great dialogue two days ago, uh, Raihan Salam and Matt Iglesias, and Raihan's point that I thought was uh, extremely salient was he said, um, 
you know, look at LASIK surgery, for instance, and LASIK surgery is something that most insurance does not pay for, and that because that's sort of a individual folks, you know, making consumer choices about uh, whether or not they're going to get the surgery has made the surgery go up in quality and down in cost uh, for most. So th that's sort of the conservative concept um, about, uh, and, and there's the, the one of the posts that I'll bring up is you've all live in at um, National Review's The Corner. Uh, he's referencing, um, it's sort of a back and forth, uh, he's referencing Paul Krugman. Um, in a post on the President's speech yesterday, he offers a great example of how some on the left think about health care costs, uh, which he says, um, the ideal then is technocratic management where experts, quote, who actually know about health care and health care costs are the ones who say yes and no. The alternative is understood to be insurance companies deciding what will be paid for. But what about consumers? The actual alternative to being governed by Krugman's philosopher accountants is allowing insurers to offer relatively broad, though still regulated, variety of options, allowing people to choose among those options based on their individual priorities and wishes. The purchase is subsidized up to a point, and as Krugman says rather amazingly, and this is a quote from his the thing, you can always buy whatever health care you want. The question is what taxpayers should pay for. So I read that line and thought that was interesting too coming from him. Anyhow, it says, and at that point you will certainly get downward pressure on the prices that insurers charge since they will want to get a piece of the pie. If the government provides about $15,000 to the average Medicare recipient, there will be insurers competing to offer attractive insurance options at that price. They won't leave that money on the table. And there will be com others competing at higher levels for seniors who want to supplement the premium support level. Unlike today, there will be a reason for insurers to offer coverage people want at a price people can afford. And they would have the freedom to experiment with the various ways of giving people what they want more efficiently. Which I think is a good summary of the general sort of conservative point about how the Ryan plan would reduce health care costs. I mean, so that is you know, potentially the debate we may have in 2012, you know, two different visions of the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. One where, uh, as you said, you know, uh, consumers, uh, you know, sort of the burdens are on them. You know, you, you're you going to have a finite amount of money, and we think that if with that sort of limitation on you, you will make more uh, cost-efficient healthcare decisions. Um, or what the president is talking about, which is, uh, Let's try to create a situation where we're, put, we're giving the, the right incentives to doctors uh, to provide treatments that are cost effective. Uh, and so on the consumer end, you're not being uh, you know, cajoled into things that well, are. What I wonder is why insurance companies wouldn't also have that same incentive, though, to make sure that doctors aren't over treating and that, that you know, I mean, I, I think in many cases the insurance company does not have such different. Uh, motivations to want to reduce the costs of healthcare uh, in terms of how much doctors are charging for uh, specific things or over treatment. I mean, that, that's not just the government that would have that sort of incentive. Um, but to your point about the well, so, but, I mean, the question there is a is a question of how good is your information, how good is your data? Exactly, and I think that's one of the biggest risks of, and this is a big risk that Republicans and conservatives run into all the time when we talk about offering choice is we assume that everybody wants a really complicated choice. <laughs> that folks, you know, and I, I think that folks do generally want to feel in control of their lives and feel in control of the things that impact their lives. Uh, but I think we often like to tout our plans as we're going to give you the choice between 20 different healthcare options and isn't that great. And I think this is just coming from my background as a opinion researcher. This is not anything I've read on a blog, but it's something that I feel is a potential blind spot for conservatives, is we think of choice as this fabulous thing, this buzzword that everybody will love. But um, I think there's this great book called The Paradox of Choice. Whose, the name of the author escapes me. But basically, that it says that folks don't always necessarily want a million different choices, that sometimes they feel more comfortable with the choice they've made when it has come from a more defined set of options. And so I think. Folks using choice, and this is going to expand consumer choice as a strong political argument. Um, I think as a policy argument, I think consumers make better, maybe the ones that are best suited to drive driving down healthcare costs. We're going to disagree on that. But I think as a political <laughs> thing, trying to say that we're going to let consumers make these decisions, and we think that's a huge political winner. I think there's big risk in that because. Folks already hate having to read through everything that their health care plan involves or doesn't involve. And when they get to the pharmacy and they find out that X, Y, or Z drug's not covered, and 
that it's already complex enough that if we if adding choice sounds like adding complexity, that's a huge potential risk for conservatives. So if we can just bring this back to uh, less high-minded matters, I hate, Sorry. I hate to. No, I, I, you know, I, I, I I'd rather. Thanks for ranting today. <laughs> I, I, I'd rather have a policy debate, but we, we have a we have a the weekend blog mission. Uh, so I'm just Correct. trying to be. Thank you for getting try, me back on track. I'm, just, I'm just trying to be a stickler. Uh, so the, I mean, I think Ryan is certainly uh, setting uh, the laying out groundwork for having this type of policy discussion dominate the conversation over the next several months. Obama seems very willing to engage with him directly, didn't, didn't shy away from it. Uh, and so if there are folks on the left that are very happy to see Obama do that much, um, and probably one of the more enthusiastic uh, 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 enthusiastic commentaries about the speech was Michael Tomaski, who blogs at the, the Guardian website, uh, who said, uh, uh, I'm sorry, why find the proper, <laughs> proper quote? Um, he said, pretty astonishingly direct stuff coming from the man who likes to lay back. The one sentence takeaway of this speech, he showed today that he is willing to fight the GOP on straightforward ideological grounds and not just by saying, hey, my numbers aren't quite as severe as theirs. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's always been a knock on the left that he doesn't have a narrative and, he any, 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 and he's just getting bogged down in policy specifics and that is and that is weakening his ability to get good deals. So he seemed to achieve uh, that today, although as far as bloggers who were critical of the speech, the criticism was perhaps a little milder than a lot of other things you've seen from the blogosphere in, in terms of Obama lately. But they weren't nitpicking about his narrative. They were criticizing the, the end goals of, of the policy. Uh, Paul Krugman, who actually led on his New York Times blog with um, you know, a rousing, uh, rousing endorsement of the speech, relatively speaking, for where Krugman is usually on Obama, then walked it back a bit after the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities was uh, mildly critical of the president's ratio of uh, spending cuts to tax increases in his vision. It would be a three to one spending cuts to tax increases. Uh, and Krugman concluded by saying, what we got today was much better than some of the hints and trial balloons. You know, specifically, there weren't, they weren't direct cuts to Medicare and Social Security in the, in the vision. It's a plan we could live with, but it's a center-right plan already. If it's the starting point for negotiations that move the solution towards lower taxes for the rich, rich and even harsher cuts to the poor, just say no. And this is a theme of a lot of the criticism that remains, is that Obama is still playing on, on conservative turf. Uh, Joshua Hall, an alternate, uh, who was probably the harshest critic, saying lots of flour, we talked about a major distraction. Uh, and uh, Matt Iglesias, who is probably not, not the most strident commentator in the liberal blogosphere, headlined his post, Barack Obama and the end of big government liberalism, uh, saying this was a speech sketched out of position to the right of my end of big government liberalism posture. He suggested ways to pare back projected increases in the cost of existing programmatic commitments to health care. He proposed some increases in taxation to cover projected increases in the cost of existing, I'm sorry, he, he, I think he repeated himself, increases in taxation uh, on, on the same area. Uh, and then on top of that, he proposed the pareback spending on other existing programmatic, programmatic commitments in order to project, cover projected increases in the cost of existing programmatic commitments to health care. Um, that doesn't leave any wiggle room if visions dance in your head of universe, universal pre-K or paid family leave. It implies the end to the agenda of smaller class sizes and higher teacher salaries. Uh, it avoids the kind of catastrophic cutbacks in infrastructure spending, but seems to rule out any substantial increase. Um, uh, I'm not quite as convinced that what he's posturing uh, uh, condemns us uh, to that. Um, there's, there's, probably a, there's probably a lot of wiggle room all, all over the place uh, if, if, if you want. Uh, but so yeah, there is that concern that uh, Obama's talking a good game, but uh, and because there's such a level of mistrust, because of the past deals on the left, that they're not confident that he's going to follow through with an actual policy, if it even comes down to uh, an actual deal uh, on a long-term uh, budgetary vision. So he certainly calmed the waters to some degree uh, with his base, uh, much more so than if he literally had embraced the Simpson Bowles recommendations on Social Security and Medicare. But there's still that hesitancy that what's around the corner might not be something they would swallow. Fascinating, fascinating. It's always, uh, I, I was wondering if the speech yesterday was going to fire up 
the, the liberal base or not, just because it seemed in it, the, the rhetorical tone of it seemed to be, you know, it was noted it's a little more campaign-ish in nature than sort of a more staid policy speech. And if maybe this is, uh, you know, he's being given advice to to start to kill to kill the plan before it really begins to get any to kill Ryan's plan before it begins to get any traction. Well, I think you know I, I try to be careful not to oversimplify what the base is uh, and. The liberal blogosphere part of the base, I think, will never be energized for this president. Uh, they were not terribly energized for him in the first place. That's not science so what's well understood. Uh, but they were always more skeptical about him going in. They're even more deeply skeptical of the outright oppositional in some areas going forward. Uh, I don't think he could ever recapture that back, uh, certainly not with the general strategies that he's, he's proposing. Uh, but it doesn't mean that there, that, that there lacks any kind of Diehard enthusiasm for for the president. Uh, you know his his numbers among Democrats are, are are still pretty good overall, and he hasn't sunk as deep in his approval ratings as other recent Democratic presidents have, Clinton and, and Carter, um, and certainly not having a full blown abandonment uh, that that LBJ had you know over the over the Vietnam War. Maybe such things might happen in a, in a, in a, in a second term, but uh, if Afghanistan ends up being a quagmire, uh, but uh, you know he he isn't suffering anything like that yet. But you you did see, of course, in Obama's um, re-election announcement, the video that he led with was certainly more of a tempered kind of message than than the more rousing change we can't believe in message. There's there's they're trying to inject a dose of, of realism uh, to it and not and not do an oversell. Uh, but I don't think that necessarily means that uh, Obama lacks enthusiasm supporters and people that will knock on doors. I think those folks will still be out there. Excellent. Well I, I have a feeling that they will still be out there uh, and will probably get re-energized once a Republican challenger is uh, chosen, which I think brings us to our final topic. Yes. Uh, the various 2012 headlines have been percolating around the conservative blog sphere um, this week. And so there are kind of three big ones that uh, I think are worth mentioning. Uh, the first is the Donald Trump uh, Burger King story. He, um, you're, you're not on the Trump bandwagon? You're not supporting the, the Republican frontrunner? Uh, no, I don't know if I mentioned this in earlier weeks, but um, the, my mom is this sort of consistent, uh, she predicted that Barack Obama would be elected president. She was long, I mean, she saw him that first time on Oprah. She went on, and she was like, I don't know who this guy is, but he's totally going to be president. And I was like, at this point, you know, everybody thought Hillary Clinton was just going to get, you know, I thought, I don't know if he's going to run, Mom, like, what are you talking about? Um, and she also managed to call Charlie Crist losing uh, to Marco Rubio back way, way, way early when it was just, you know, some conservative bloggers that were supporting Rubio and the NRSC and said, oh, Chris has got to be putting money to move on. So I view her as a relatively good focus group in which she's sort of, you know, suburban mom, Orlando, Florida. Um, she, this is prior to his birther kick, thinks that Donald Trump could be a could seriously be the nominee. And I was like, oh, uh, you might be two for three here. <laughs> but, that was, but that was before the birther, before birther jack. The birther but now your mom's not a birther, I assume. No, she's not. Um, so I, you know, I don't know to what extent this um, rather vocal train of thought of this will resonate with folks like my mom. But um, you have Ed Morrissey at Hot Air, who has a post up about how Mitt Romney now having jumped into the race is blasting Trump's birther focus. Uh, that at a at a fundraiser on Tuesday night, Mitt Romney sort of came out and said. Uh, Quote, I think the citizenship test has been passed. I believe the president was born in the United States. There are real reasons to get this guy out of office. Uh, this is what Romney told CNBC's Larry Kudlow the day after he formally announced uh, that he's running for president. And so the, the Ed Morrissey Post says, Romney is the first of the Republican hopefuls to push back against Trump's further focus, and the evident delight in the national media to focus again on that issue that voters obviously rejected in 2008. Uh, and then he skips and he goes, Trump, on the other hand, has very little to recommend him as a candidate other than his talent for self-promotion. Uh, I wrote a piece for CNN today that builds off my post yesterday. Trump may need to rely on the freak show quality he has employed thus far in order to keep people from taking too close a look at who Trump is, uh, which I, I think is a, a pretty good thing. I mean, I don't think, I think if Trump really wants to do this, and I don't think he does, I, he, he just came out and he's going to announce when he's going to announce at the finale of The Celebrity Apprentice. It completely makes sense to me. He's just 
doing this for attention, people. He's not really going to run for president. And if he does, like, I mean, I can maybe see him trying to jump in as an independent candidate, but uh, this just seems way too crazy for him. But now, um, but, uh, you know, uh, Ben Smith at Politico uh, suggested that the types of things that he is doing now, I mean, he, he grabbed onto the birther issue and no other presidential candidate was um, and explicitly said that it was because polls show that half of the Republican primary electorate questions Obama's citizenship. Uh, and, and he's also grabbed on to, to issues like, let's, let's take Libya's oil and let's take Iraq's oil for ourselves so the victor go the spoils. Uh, and, uh, and, and Ben Smith suggested, you know, these aren't the kinds of things you would do if you were just trying to goose your ratings um, because, you know, it's not just you know, people on the far right that watch reality TV shows. So uh, you're clearly trying to appeal to a distinct segment of the Republican primary electorate. Um, so why would you be doing that if you weren't thinking about actual political I think because uh, he has internalized that headlines are headlines and eyeballs are eyeballs. And mm -hmm. he gets to build the Trump brand because people know who Donald Trump is. And so that's why I'm not concerned at all about these polls that show him doing relatively well among the Republican electorate because it is almost surely name on the issue. No, I mean, you had some of these candidates who just now got in the race within the last week. I, I, I mean, I mean not, can you, can you separate about the Donald Trump thing? Can you separate the fact that I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Can no, you separate the fact that? I mean, it's not just that he's on TV. I mean, he spent several days talking about nothing else but Obama's citizenship, and that correlated with the rise in his polls. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that every Republican primary voter questions his citizenship, but. It, does it at least suggest that, uh, that Trump has consolidated a good chunk of those voters who do think it's the most important issue? On our, I mean, it's, it's not just simply that he was on TV a lot this week? I mean, I, but I don't believe that the birth of constituency is that large a portion of the electorate. Or we're, rather, ta or, or we're, we're talking 17 to 19 percent. That's what he's getting. I mean, he's a front runner in a very weak and fragmented field. I mean, I, could it, could, it set, could 19 percent be the birther part of the Republican primary electorate? Uh, I'm, I, I don't know. I mean, I've, I've seen data that has shown that far greater numbers of people are not sure that Obama was born in the United States, but to the extent that they care or that they get very exercised about this issue, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I really think at this point, maybe it's, it, it, it would be more of a, sat a show of dissatisfaction with the current field than anything. I don't think that large folks, I don't think the Republican nominee uh, is going to be decided because a large number of people get on the birther train. I mean, even even really conservative blogs have consistently rejected this further focus and have said, move on people. And so it just, it's, it's somewhat frustrating that um, Donald Trump is getting so many eyeballs to these folks in this issue again. <laughs> and now you have the issue too, I read this today, that there are some folks who are beginning to question Mick Romney's birth certificate? <laughs> I didn't see, didn't see this. Yeah, no, I mean, well, it's, so it's, he did spend a lot of time in France, there right? There has been conspiracy theory uh, day on the internet because now Gawker is bringing back up again the Palin and Trigg story. Uh, well, well, Joe McGinnis is pushing this. Uh, yeah. Joe, 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 Joe McGinnis, who is has been a very well respected uh, you know nonfiction author, but very controversially you know rented a house next to Palin's to to research a book on her, and then he launched his own blog in in, in, in some pre promotion for the book release. And he basically said flat out that he's going to go into this this uh, you know trig the nature around Trigg's birth issue, which Andrew Sullivan uh, pursued relentlessly when almost everyone else gave up on it and said that there was nothing there. Um, Con Carroll, who um, sometimes has sat in your chair for the weekend block, you know, still calls him Crazy Andy uh, for that obsession. And I'm sorry, not I've never been one to take. Uh, those issues uh, terribly seriously, uh, but it's notable that Joe McGinnis is basically su it, it suggesting that he has revelations about this in, in, in his book. Well, and the thing that was posted today on Gawker purports to be this really academic study, and, and, it's, and it's presented as rather than trying to prove that Trigg is not the child, it's trying to prove that the media was asleep on, asleep on the job and do, do their due diligence, but um, I just, I I question why this keeps coming up and why, uh, I mean, I guess I, it, it's, you'd think, you think there was no other news 
news going on, that we need to dive into all these crazy conspiracy theories as if like we were not about to have to vote on raising the debt ceiling or <laughs> the fiscal future of the country. But, well, this, I mean, this, this is one of the downsides of the blogosphere, and I'm not saying that the blogosphere is a scourge of all humanity, uh, but the, it, it does... And this, and this gets also to you know, the level of defection um, and dissatisfaction with the budget deal. Uh, yeah, I, I, I fell for it in that I presume because of all the noise I was hearing about the Tea Party and the Tea Party congressmen and the, 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 the large freshman class that uh, there was this unruly Republican caucus that they were not being able to consolidate because all you hear over and over again is that um, you know, thirty billion is not enough, and you know, shut down. What's the big deal? And all, all that, um, all those fireworks um, obscured the fact that, as it turned out, the vote the Republican caucus was not that insane. Not that I agree with them ideologically, but they were they were not terribly interested in in shutting down the government at the end of the day. Uh, so it's very easy for folks uh, you know, to take this a step farther. You know, people who who tout conspiracy theories because they're sort of fun to bat around uh, can get a lot of attention. Uh, 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 on the internet, it can bubble up into cable TV. Glenn Beck showed how you can establish a niche audience basically, basically by spitting one conspiracy theory after another. Um, you know, if, ten years ago, the kind of ratings Glenn Beck had would get you canceled in a week, uh, but because the media landscape is so fragmented, it gives the impression that he is speaking to an audience much larger than, than, than he is, and that makes people, you know, it, just, it all feeds on itself. So you're talking about all those sorts of things and not talking about the actual issues that matter. Well, I hope that, uh, I, I assume that this, well, we'll find out at the end of the Celebrity Apprentice whether or not, uh, well, no, we actually will find out. We'll find out when we're going to find out. It's Donald Trump and the Bertha Crane. It's Trump's world. We all, we all, we all just live in it. But before we get, uh, we wrap have to up. Pay to log into a website or like, yeah, I'm sure they'll find a way to like. Sorry, I'm terrible on this one. That, that, that's right that's fine. <laughs> and I'm sorry to keep us too focused on on Trump and conspiracy theories, but it was also a week where Mitt Romney announced his exploratory committee. I believe Rick, Rick Santorum announced his exploratory committee. Um, Kayla Barber Rick speaking. Rick announced at night, like at ten o'clock at night on cable. <laughs> On Fox, yeah. So yeah. I'm not saying I'm not saying he's the best campaign strategist out there, but uh, there are other people running for office for president who are not Donald Trump. Uh, is there any? But there's also all this notion that Republicans are dissatisfied with their choices and are pining for someone else to jump in. Uh, were the, was there a conservative reaction to these events? Were the people saying that that Mitt Romney had a good announcement video it was better than Tim Pawlenty's video? I liked his sober presentation. I liked the fact that he is not going down the birther path. Uh, Rick Santorum, is he the, the real conservative hero here? He's really sticking it to Obama. Is there any chatter about this sort of thing, or is everyone just sort of shrugging their shoulders or hoping someone else jumps in? Um, so the, the two stories that I have picked up on the most are, one, there was a pretty big hire that happened uh, at the start of the week for the Tim Valenti campaign. Uh, he hired uh, 28-year-old Nick Ayers, who used to be the head of, or he headed up the RGA, um, under set governance I've been Purdue, and then later on in sort of modern history uh, under Haley Barbour. And so it was a big story that um, Ayers would go to the Plenty campaign one because he's viewed as a relative, as a very seriously sought after young strategist. And I don't even just want to say an up and coming strategist. I mean, he's somebody who got chosen to be Rice Priebus's transition director at the RNC and he has really made a serious name for himself. Um, in a quite a short time in national politics. And so the, the post of Eric Erickson at Red State uh, with the headline, Nick Ayers, the big news you might not have noticed. Uh, and this is interesting. It represents a, a shift for Tim Valenti in terms of conservatives if they're paying attention to things like who somebody's campaign uh, this is the now, the, now, if I can make a slight... Oh, you're, you're reading a quote? Uh, yeah, he says, I've done my best to ignore Tim Valenti. He has never struck me as the most exciting politician. The global warming position is being squeamish. He has always had an okay record as governor, but around the edges, he struck me as not really a movement conservative. So I haven't paid much attention to Tim Valenti. And then he went and hired Nick Ayers. And then he gushes about how great Nick Ayers is and says, if this is the kind of guy he's hiring, I'm going to take him more seriously than that. Now, uh, Huffington Post Hill, which is a nightly email product that the Huffington Post news staff uh, puts out, uh, uh, wildly mocked uh, the email that Nick Ayers sent out <laughs> announcing his his hiring because it seemed to be a whole lot about Nick Ayers <laughs> and about his his uh, you know 
personal religious reflections in making this decision. Uh, and uh, they just sort of found the whole thing kind of odd that he, seemed to, that he didn't seem to be like, talking about how great Tim Pawlenty was, that he was talking about uh, how this was some sort of a momentous decision for him. And most staff hires don't draw that much attention to themselves when they get hired by campaigns, but this wasn't commented much on, on the right. They're just more excited that he's been hired. Uh, no, so I think in, in terms of the whole relationship to God thing, I mean, I certainly didn't see any conservative bloggers say that that was a bad thing. I think, in fact, in this Eric Erickson post, he says he's a young, principled conservative grounded in an unapologetic, unapologetic faith in Christ. I mean, I think that there are a number of conservative bloggers of the Christian faith who uh, would say, you know, hey, more power to him for being so public and, you know, for not shying away from, you know, this is a big part of his life. Um, but I, I think this is more, this is not anything I read in a blog post, it's more an observation from chatting with other folks who it work, work in the campaign world is that it's interesting that Tim Valenti has been making a number of, that most of the headlines you see coming out of the Valenti campaign are about big name hires, plenty of raised, and these are, you know, it's all sort of process and infrastructure. And that part of the reason for that, of touting, look how great Nick Ayers is, it's such a big deal that Tim Valenti got me, is to make the case that Tim Valenti is the kind of candidate that deserves a campaign manager of great stature, or deserves a campaign manager of who is a big deal. And so I think that the Valenti campaign, as of right now, has not been as focused on Tim Valenti, but is more focused on Valenti operation, which is why you would see that sort of different shift, whereas, um, you know, just today, uh, Mitt Romney hired uh, Gail Gitcho to come and be his communications director, and you're, you know, folks are talking about how great she is, but she's not out talking about how great she is in the operation. Uh, Mitt Romney is talking job, 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 economy, economy, and so I think that's a strategic shift. Mitt Romney doesn't have to tout a big organization right now, whereas I think the Kalenti campaign is calculated. They have to make a big deal about the organization. The machine right. Well, like Palenti pulls around 2% and Romney pulls around around 20, which right now makes you put you in front runner status. So Palenti has to show something that um, that he deserves to be considered a first tier candidate because um, he's not getting that in the poll numbers and probably won't get at that in poll numbers for, for some time. Uh, so but you're, you're suggesting that his, his strategy is at least working as far as generating discussion amongst prominent conservative bloggers. Well, with this particular hire, uh, it, it generated positive discussion. I, mean, I, there was, I, I could not find a single post saying anything bad about the hiring of Nick Ayers. I mean, there's, everybody has really glowing things to say about him as a political operative, as a political mind. Um, and uh, I saw I saw no criticism. I think this was a very good get for Valenti. I think it really puts him. Uh, it, it, you know, if it's, if it's changing the mind of someone like Eric Erickson, I'm sure there are more out there. And no grand reactions of the blogosphere to the Romney or Santorum announcements? Um, I didn't really see much about Santorum. Uh, as far as Mitt Romney, uh, the, the big reaction that I saw, there was, the, the one post I saw, which is from the Trump Forum, is that Romney is not being cynical enough uh, from the Open School Green again. Uh, he says, uh, when you compare the answers Romney is giving to the media in comparison to other leading Republican with an exploratory committee to Lenti, Romney seems to be too eager to say what he believes to be true rather than what he should say to win points with the conservative base. Uh, so I think, you know, if you look, Romney's been incredibly consistent. And his his whole rollout is really low profile, too. Um, I mean, he's not trying to come out and make waves, make a big show about some big operation, look at the, the machine and building. Um, he is really, really, really playing it quiet, uh, which I, I think is I think is, is the right move. That he's staying sort of on a single uh, relevant message, economy and jobs, and that he's not making a big flash right now. I, I, I think it's I think it's a wise decision. Now the Demo the Massachusetts Democratic Party um, did a whole series of, of things like online and off cele celebrating the fifth anniversary of Massachusetts health care reform mm -hmm. with a with a thanks mitt <laughs> campaign um, to try to make sure every Republican voter knows that he passed something analogous to the president's uh, health care plan. Uh, any reaction to that on the right this week or did Romney succeed in sort of uh, Making sure that 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 he just sort of looked past that and conservatives didn't take much note of it either. Well, and what's interesting is that in his comments, in Romney's comments on Tuesday night, he, he mentions. I mean, he's not shying away from the fact I was governor of the state of Massachusetts. Here's the lobby in the place, but sort of dismisses a lot of these like Democrats writing these thank you notes and things. As he says, you know, when they were putting their law in place, nobody ever called me and said, "What would you do differently." Nobody ever called me and said, what do you think is good and what do you think is bad? So now they're talking like, like I inspired all of this stuff. 
when I acknowledge that there are pieces of this law that I would not do the same way again. And so I think a lot of conservatives have been very frustrated that Romney would not run away more strongly from this plan. Um, and you have Philip Klein, uh, he's not at American Tech Theater anymore, so I can't consider him a blogger. He's at Washington Examiner. He had a piece for his, um, is Romney care radioactive for the GOP? So not even just is it going to be tough for him in the primary, but if he wins, what does that mean in the general? Do we completely lose the health care issue as one on which we can draw a contrast? And to what extent does that put our chances to win the election? So there's, there is remains grave concern about whether or not Romney will be able to maneuver um, and position his health care policy as, as, as a positive instead of a negative. Uh, should we leave it on that note? I think so. All right. Always good to talk to you, Kristen. Always good talking to you, too. Take care, Bill. And, and where can they catch your new online TV show? Oh, uh, yes, you can go to PJTV. Uh, they have me on the show with uh, Amy Holmes and Katie Pavlich, who are fantastic. Um, I'm, I'm lucky to be on a show with them. Uh, and it's it's kind of a, a fun, brief little snippets where we banter about policy and the royal wedding. And <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's a fun show. So uh, if, if that's your if that's your your thing, please tune in. It would be great to have more viewers. And I'm still doing the Liberal Oasis radio show uh, on podcast at liberaloasis.com every Saturday, so please download that as well. And uh, we'll see you next week here at Blogging Hits TV on This Week in Blog. Take care.